So everyone in this space has probably heard of our Unitarian Universalism seven principles, but have you ever heard of the seven anti-principles? <laughs> and the answer is, of course not, because I just cooked them up last night. So, <laughs> anti-principle number seven. The only existence that matters is human existence. This is the opposite, of course, of respect. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, they're anti-principles, so we should hiss them. This is, of course, the opposite of respect for the interdependent web of all existence of which we are all a part. Do you see how the anti-principle logic goes? See that? Okay. Anti-principle number six, the goal of America first. All right, this is verse versus the goal of world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all. Anti-principle number five, might makes right. This is versus the right of conscience and the use of the democratic process within our congregations and in society at large. Anti-principle number four, the uncritical consumption of alternative facts versus a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. Anti-principle number three, judgmentalism towards one another and spiritual apathy in our congregations <laughs> versus acceptance of one another and encouragement to spiritual growth in our congregations. Anti-principle number two, bullying and humiliation in human relations versus, right, seriously, you gotta hiss that one, versus justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. And finally, anti-principle number one, the inherent shamefulness of every person versus the inherent worth and dignity of every person. All of these anti-principles are at play in our world today, and we know it. And as Unitarian Universalists, we are called to resist. This is fundamentally not about politics. That's not the issue. The issue is faithfulness to our core values as a religious people. That is it. But today our focus shall be exclusively on shame. Unitarian Universalism's first principle says that people are fundamentally worthy and with dignity. Shame says people are fundamentally worthless. The first principle says that a person's essential worth is unconditional. Shame is the voice in your head saying, you are never good enough, or who do you think you are? The first principle, it makes us feel calm. It makes us feel centered. It makes us feel whole. But shame, shame makes us feel like the life is being choked out of us. It makes us feel like we are being pulled down into an abyss of chaos. And the experience is so overwhelmingly traumatic that we instinctively defend against it. We do anything to make it go away. And shame researchers tell us that there are essentially three things that people do. Number one, we move away by withdrawing, by keeping secrets, by hiding, by silencing ourselves. Two, we move toward by seeking to appease, to please, to be a people pleaser. And then the third thing people do, we move against by getting aggressive, by getting violent, fighting shame with shame. Shame is soul killing. Shame is getting laid off and having to tell your pregnant wife, Shame is having someone ask you, when are you due when you are not pregnant? <laughs> Shame is hiding the fact that you're in recovery from some addiction. Shame is raging at your kids. Shame is bankruptcy. Shame is your boss calling you an idiot in front of the client. Shame is infertility. Shame 
is hearing your parents fight through the walls and wondering if you are the only one who feels this afraid. Any and all of these moments are ones where we feel that no one wants us to survive, that we are a part of nobody, that no one in their right mind will say, you are important to me. Our first principle is peace. It is like the poem from earlier that says, all people are children when they sleep. They open their hands and breathe in that quiet rhythm heaven has given them. They pucker their lips like small children and open their hands halfway. Soldiers and statesmen, servants and masters. But shame is the war in us. Shame is the sickness. Shame makes us vulnerable to aggression, depression, eating disorders, addictions, violence, suicide. We heard Brene Brown say all of it. I would even go so far as to suggest that the seeds of anti-principles numbers two through seven are planted by anti-principle number one. So we need to talk about what researcher Brene Brown calls shame resilience. But what we Unitarian Universalists can also call very simply practicing our first principle. We can call it that. And it starts by raising awareness, which is what we are already doing. Shame is real. It is not just an internal state that stays inside us. It infects the world. We need to know this, and we need to speak it. Shame, says Brene Brown, derives its power from being unspeakable. Shame hates having words wrapped around it, and that's what we're doing today. We're wrapping words around shame. And then what we do is this. We reality check it. That's what we do. And an important part of reality checking shame is, is knowing that gender messages and expectations are foundational shame triggers. There's lots of shame triggers, but these are key shame triggers. And this means that people who identify primarily as masculine and people who identify primarily as feminine, they are triggered by very different things. Consider this gender expectation. It goes like this. Be perfect, but don't make a fuss about it. And don't take your time away from, from anything, like your family, or your partner, or your work, to achieve your perfection. If you're truly worthy, perfection should be easy. Okay, so, is this a primarily masculine or feminine expectation? What do you think? Or what about this? Never allow people to think that you are weak, masculine or feminine. Or this, don't upset anyone or hurt anyone's feelings, but say what's on your mind. <laughs> Masculine or feminine? Yeah. Or this, you need to be strong. You need to be capable for everyone you love. You need to be able to provide everything they need. You need to succeed at work in your relationships, in bed, with money, with kids, with everything, masculine or feminine. The, prim the, the primarily feminine expectations are, as you correctly saw, the first and third. And did you notice that both are classic double binds? What that means is there's just no way to win. Anything you do is going to disappoint. This tragic, so, so what it means is, is the tragic solution becomes just staying small and sweet and quiet and modest. But then also comes the inevitable repressed rage. And that repressed rage very often comes out at meanness towards other women who refuse to stay small. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that's what happens. And as for the primarily masculine expectations, the second and the fourth, it's all about not being a wimp. Now, the word that Brene Brown uses is not wimp. She uses the word that Donald Trump is very well known for, unfortunately, is grabbing. Don't be one of those. Don't be one of those. 
Don't show fear. Don't show inadequacy. And one of the many refreshing and surprising things that Brene Brown surfaces through her shame research is this finding that in those moments when real vulnerability happens in men, most women recoil in fear. And fear manifests as anything from disappointment to disgust. And she goes on to quote a friend who says, men know what women really want. They want us to pretend to be vulnerable. We get really good at pretending. Now, I'm sure that in itself is a huge conversation, but the main point is it's just hard for everybody whatever gender you happen to identify with. But it gets more manageable when you are aware of the unrealistic standards that can send you into a shame spiral, and on this basis, you can reality check it. As someone who identifies with the feminine, you can say no to the double bind. The double bind is unrealistic, and I'm not going to bring that into my life. As someone who identifies with the masculine, you can say no to the demand that you are always and in always strong. You can say no to that insanity. We have to reality check the unrealistic gender expectations. Now, I wish someone had preached this sermon to me years ago. Years ago, male shame was a factor in ending my marriage. And I didn't see it. I didn't see it until this week, actually. And I've gone over the whole thing over and over again, as you can imagine. And I thought I had discovered everything there was to be discovered there, but I hadn't. Reflecting anew on shame this week led me to connecting some dots that had not been connected before. It's actually rather simple. My wife back then was fully in her world of work. It was a world that I was not a part of, even as my work was separate from hers, and, and that fact that she gained such satisfaction and grew so much from a world completely apart from me, it triggered shame. It meant I could not provide all she needed. And to the male in me, there could only be one conclusion. And I was all sensitive male, but the conditioning stuck. To the male in me, there was only one conclusion. It meant I was weak. It meant I was unworthy. Years of feeling unworthiness melted my insides. I did not know how to talk about it. I didn't know what was happening. I could not reality check. I could not recover. What I did was withdraw into my work, into you guys, I withdrew into my skating, I hid, my wife would step forward, I would step back, and the result was mutual desperation. I just didn't have the awareness and the reality checking skills, and well, I do now. I have earned them the hard way, as very often we do. And I am telling this story despite the fact that I might very well have committed the grave sin of pastoral oversharing, <laughs> pastoral TMI, but I risk this because I want to demonstrate in my own life yet another way to practice our first principle. Tell your shame stories to people who love you and people you trust. Tell them. Tell your stories to people who will respond, not with criticism or condescension or with armchair quarterbacking, but they'll tell you their stories right back. They will be human with you. They will be alongside you. And what happens is the building of empathic connection. Shame cannot survive empathy. It cannot survive empathy. I am asking you, to love me in my shame, and I'm asking you to love each other in your shame. Do it because you are Unitarian Universalist. 
We cultivate love, says Brene Brown when we allow our most vulnerable and powerful selves to be deeply seen and known, and when we honor the spiritual connection that grows from that offering with trust and respect and kindness and affection. Love is not something that we give or we get. It is something we nurture and grow, a connection that can only be cultivated between people when it exists within each of them. We can only love others as much as we love ourselves. I really, I really do need you to survive, and you need me to survive too. We really can be one body. Practice the first principle, and it really can be so.